My talk this morning is on um, metatarsalgia, so it's based around a JOS article from 2010. Um, however, I've taken a slightly different slant to the article, which focuses more on uh, on particular types of management. I'm focusing a lot more on the diagnostic or the different uh, causes of metatarsalgia, and then going into a little bit um, different. So just as a background, uh, as we all are aware, um, metatarsalgia is uh, defined as, um, as a type of pain in the metatarsal regions, or more specifically uh, in the plantar area of the forefoot beneath the second to fourth uh, metatarsal heads. There are a lot of different causes for uh, metatarsalgia, but um, overall it results from an abnormal load distribution across the forefoot. Uh, it's, a, it's quite useful to uh, look into the causes of metatarsalgia by going through the different phases of gait and defining it in this way. So um, the article from JOS uh, defined gait into two different phases, so the swing phase and the stance phase, with toe-off and heel strike being the start of each of those two phases. Uh, and within the stance phase, they divide they divide it into first, second and third rocker uh, aspects. So first of all, um, heel strike, starting with heel strike in the first rocker phase, uh, then dorsiflexion of the ankle to uh, flatten the foot, and finally uh, forefoot. the forefoot in contact with the ground requires dorsiflexion of the anterior heel joint. Within from this, we can then look at the different types of causes of metatarsal pain. So uh, problems that affect dorsiflexion of the ankle uh, or more specifically cause over-recruitment of the extensor muscles uh, can contribute to or can be a cause of metatarsal pain. So these include uh, anti tibialis anterior weakness and uh, hind foot varus or a cavus foot, as well as triceps. Uh, if we go into the heel strike part, so if there's any condition that's uh, causing difficulty in um, ankle movement as well as, uh, so, so for example, a tight heel cord or a cavus foot, um, that can contribute to first rock of pain. And uh, again, secondly, with the ankle joint motion in the second rocker, uh, phase um, if there's any ankle joint impingement or, uh, or increased plantar function of the lesser metatarsals, we can start to produce um, metatarsalgia in that, in that phase of the cycle. And finally, um, MTP joint pathology or subluxation uh, can contribute to third rock of metatarsal pain. Uh, another way to classify um, metatarsalgia is into primary, secondary, and iatrogenic metatarsalgia. Uh, and um, to start with the primary metatarsalgia, that can be uh, come from problems with the length of the metatarsals, uh, the relationship between different metatarsals, and finally the relationship to the rest of the foot. So within problems with the metatarsal length, it can be a genital difference or a relative difference such as um, hallux valgus um, or severe hallux valgus with a uh, high intermetatarsal angle uh, that overall would increase the pressure load to uh, or beneath the second metatarsal head and beyond that. Um, with regards to the relationship between the metatarsals, um, there are a range of different causes including increased uh, lesser metatarsal plantar flexion, uh, first ray insufficiency, uh, and metatarsal uh, specific metatarsal head abnormalities such as neoplasia or infection um, to increase the size of the metatarsal head. And finally, uh, as I mentioned before, forefoot equinus, um, oh, sorry, posterior equinus uh, can also increase Uh, this is a table just looking more specifically at uh, 
particular clauses within those different groups of, um, of classification of carbon that are tapped out at. So uh, overall those are things that we've just discussed, um, including the, uh, as I said, the hallux valgus that can contribute to a relative um, metatarsal length of time, um, and the different types of uh, uh, foot problems that can also cause primary metatarsal. Uh, secondary metatarsalgia, uh, effectively, um, can be uh, either from a direct uh, pathology of the uh, sort of direct condition of the metatarsal, such as trauma, or uh, indirect overload um, to the MTP joints. Um, so going through those in a bit more detail, so any trauma that causes a shortened or a, a plantar flex metatarsal can increase the local pressure beneath the metatarsal head um, or also cause transfer to other um, metatarsal heads. Um, also, uh, soft tissue injuries such as plantar plate. Um, can you read that? Sorry, because I thought it was going to be on that screen, or is it really small? Uh, um, so, plantar plate damage um, causes hyperextension of the, at the MTP joints and um, can also uh, uh, change the pressure load towards the heads of the metatarsal. Um, hallux rigidus overall causes an impaired um, first MTP joint dorsiflexion um, and therefore modifies the uh, pressure distribution across the metatarsal to, to the lesser metatarsals uh, of the foot. And uh, finally, fibroid contraction, which I'll go into later on, um, effectively is a, a partial fracture of the um, at the metatarsal head, uh, for which there's no, well, it's uh, not clear etiology at present, um, and that's the second, that's, a, uh, that's another direct cause of, um, of, uh, of pain from, um, sorry, of, of a direct effect on the metatarsal head to cause secondary metatarsal. Um, and finally, MTP joint instability and neuropathic pain uh, are also uh, can also contribute to. Um, and lastly, uh, iatrogenic metatarsalgia can come from uh, non-union or delayed union uh, from osteotomies or from resection of metatarsal heads uh, that can increase the pressure on the plantar surface of the foot. Uh, so just to go through the clinical assessment of patient presenting with metatarsalgia, so um, as with uh, every uh, foot and ankle exam, um, starting off with uh, having a look at the patient's shoe wear, whether they're using any um, proceeds. Um, finally, and then moving on to looking from uh, the anterior uh, inside and behind, um, specifically at the alignment of the foot um, and any obvious way uh, Different types of gaits can be seen with metatarsal, uh, associated with metatarsalgia that can be uh, indicative of the cause, such as a uh, um, stiff first metatarsal joint gait, which may present with um, and low pressure around the lateral aspect of the foot, and an aquinas contraction may uh, present with um, high steppage or uh, um, again uh, rolling laterally to uh, in order to um, uh, avoid or to get past the rigid dorsiflexion of the ankle. Uh, and then going on to um, uh, palpation at each MTP joint, uh, feeling for contractures or uh, instability, um, and uh, and then again going through each joint of the um, of the foot to look for any particular uh, cause that we've just gone through um, that may 
their source of their metatarsal pain. Uh, two particular special tests that come in include the silver scroll test to uh, look for the finest contracture um, or the source of it, and uh, the common block test and the presentation of a case. Um, and lastly, uh, the spine should always be checked with any um, foot and ankle condition. Um, with regards to uh, different types of keratosis that have been on examination in patients with metatarsalgia, uh, the JOS article compared second and third blocker um, keratosis. Um, so with the second blocker, they say uh, it's generally uh, um, under the metatarsal head but doesn't really extend distally, uh, whereas the third blocker keratosis may extend distally from the affected head. Uh, and they're also more generally round in appearance. Um, and these are the different causes of the uh, two types of keratosis. Uh, this is a picture just looking at the different types of, of, of second uh, block of keratosis where we can see that the uh, lesion didn't really extend distally to the toes. Um, the first picture is um, looking at a, uh, as has come from an elevated metatarsal head, and the second one, uh, B, there is from a patient with um, gastroc contraction. Um, and that third one there is from Pez Cabus deformity. Uh, this, this is then going through uh, third rocker keratosis. Um, so there we can see that there is some distal extension and uh, they also describe a more round appearance. Um, at the end. Uh, so different x-rays that can be used to assess uh, the um, a patient presenting with metatarsalgia include our usual um, weight bearing sort of x-rays uh, and assessing the uh, different aspects depending on, um, on the most likely Obviously, of, of the metatarsal pain. MRI is rarely used, uh, from my understanding, uh, in investigating this. Uh, and going into the management, um, uh, both non operative and operative uh, treatment uh, can be included, and we always obviously start with non operative treatment, including lifestyle modifications such as. Uh, uh, and put on, oh, sorry, orthoses to uh, improve distribution <coughs> of the forefoot. And again, it depends on the different cause of, of the patient's presentation. Um, analgesia and uh, physiotherapy as well. Uh, with regards to the operative management, um, uh, there's a range of different um, uh, osteotomies that uh, can be employed for um, managing metatarsalgia depending on the cause, uh, which I'll go into. But there's also soft tissue uh, options and looking again at the foot and ankle or the actual cause if there's an, uh, evidence of the neuroma. Uh, so this is just going through each of the distant, dis different um, uh, osteotomies that are described in the JOS article um, and also from different uh, papers as well. So uh, distal oblique metatarsal osteotomy or while osteotomy um, uh, basically is aiming to achieve uh, longitudinal compression through shortening of the metatarsal uh, of, the med um, of the metatarsal bone. Uh, its indications include third rocker and metatarsalgia uh, but it's contraindicated in um, osteoporosis and uh, second metatarsal um, uh, deformity associated with hallux valgus, uh, as well as um, excessive metatarsal inclination, such as in Pez cabus. Um, there are a range of different complications from a, each of the different osteotomies, um, including 